Thank you all for joining today's webinar on exciting new research from Kansas State University supported by the Health Fund that focuses on child care providers' perception of the child care subsidy program in Kansas. Uh, the child care, as you all know, the child care assistance or child care subsidy program administered by the Department of Children and Families is one of the most important tools used to address child care affordability in the state. Uh, however, just 12% of eligible families are participating in the program. Family participation in the program is tied to provider ability, availability and provider participation in the program. Um, to gain insight as to why providers participate or not, um, the Health Fund partnered with Kansas State University to survey child care providers to better understand their perception and experience with the Child Care Assistance Program. Uh, today's webinar will provide a presentation from Dr. Jennifer Francois, who will present the findings of the report that she conducted. Uh, following Dr. Francois's presentation, we'll, we will have a panel of reactors who can provide insights into the findings from the provider and policy perspective. Our panel discussion will include Desiree Strait, owner of Little Explorers Play School in Kingman, Kansas, who accepts families using subsidies. Amy Gottschammer, Executive Director of Goggles of Learning Child Development Center in Lawrence, Kansas, which also accepts families using subsidies. Christy Smith, the Executive Director of Child Care Aware of Kansas, and Emily Barnes, the Education Policy Advisor from Kansas Action for Children. The Health Fund really wants to support policymakers, the Department of Children and Families, and other state partners in Kansas and continued efforts to improve the child care system in order to make sure it best serves Kansas families. Uh, we recognize that child care affordability is a critical challenge facing many families, and we hope that this study can serve as a catalyst to help guide changes to the state's child care assistance program so that more families can gain access to its benefits and the program can also serve providers in a way that makes it easy for them to participate. I also want to recognize that the Department of Children and Families has done a great job working to strengthen the system, and we know they've done a lot of work over the last several years, including raising eligibility for child care assistance to 85% of SMI, which is approximately, well, which is $76,500 annually for a family of four. Um, as this report highlights, however, there are opportunities to improve the provider experience by improving the administrative process and payment process. Ultimately, we hope to make the system work better for all families, and we know that we can continue to work with policymakers, DCF providers to do that. Um, before turning things over to Dr. Francois, here are some housekeeping items before we get started. Given the large number of folks on, your, on the call, your lines are muted. However, we hope you can use the chat function to engage throughout this webinar. We will hold full question and answers until after the panel. Or if there are technical questions in the chat, Dr. Francois may answer them before we um, transition to the, to the panel. To get things started, please take a minute right now to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we will be monitoring it. Um, ask any questions in the chat um, and know that we will take questions after the presentations. Um, we will use the raised hand function later on in the call if we if we need to ask questions directly. However, again, please engage throughout the chat. We look forward to a robust discussion and ongoing partnerships with all of you to strengthen our child care system. With that, I'll turn things over to Jennifer Francois, Dr. Francois, to get things started. Jennifer. Thank you, David. Um, I'm very excited to be here this morning and just um, thrilled to have been given this opportunity uh, to be a part of this project. And so I've got some slides uh, to share and hopefully, see here. hopefully folks can see my slides. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Well, uh, like I said, I'm excited to be here today and I'm excited to share the results of this survey. Um, as David talked about, uh, this survey uh, was designed to gather perspectives from child care administrators on the child care subsidy system in Kansas. 
Um, the development of questions was really a joint effort uh, between Kansas State University and the United uh, Methodist Health Ministry Fund. Um, questions were both qualitative and quantitative uh, in nature, and the survey was distributed with the help of Child Care Aware of Kansas in November of 2023. Um, once we collected the responses, they were compiled um, and we cleaned uh, the data. Um, the open-ended responses were reviewed through uh, an iterative cycle and then grouped by theme. Um, and so what I'm gonna be sharing with you today, uh, this morning really just represents an overview of the data gathered. And so I'd like to start with some demographics. Um, overall, I would say we were pleased uh, with the response to the survey. Um, we had 313 respondents uh, over uh, 93 of the 105 Kansas counties. Uh, most individuals who participated identified themselves as daycare home or group daycare home administrators. This represented about 78.6% uh, of the respondents. The second largest group at 17.9% identified themselves as child care center administrators, 85.5% identified as white, and 80% were between the ages of 35 and 64. Administrators were also asked a series of questions about their program demographics, which included questions about the number of children they served between the ages of zero and five, how many children they reported serving who had special, and um, excuse me, how many children they uh, reported serving having special support needs. Uh, many administrators reported serving um, somewhere between one and five children uh, between the ages of zero and five, and serving some children who received childcare subsidy. Many programs also indicated that they did not serve any children who had special support needs, except uh, those children who had social and emotional challenges. Programs reported serving between one and five children who fell into that category. Programs also reported that most of the children in their care were white. So programs were also asked to describe their funding sources and approval status with child care fund, uh, subsidy funding. 42, or excuse me, 43 percent of programs uh, reported they received no public dollars and 50 percent reported receiving subsidy only. Uh, in terms of program approval to receive sub subsidy funded children, 60 percent reported that they are currently approved and 51.8 percent indicated that they um, currently serve at least one child uh, who is subsidy funded. We also were very interested in learning more about payment um, and uh, rate differences, if rate differences did occur. And so when asked about differences in payment rates uh, between subsidy funded and private pay families, programs responded that when rate differences do occur, um, there's at least a $50 a month gap between tuition for private pay families and families who receive childcare subsidy. And in some cases, these differences um, have, are having the potential to influence a program's decision on whether to accept a subsidy funded family. And we're going to see that um, come out uh, in some of the slides that I'm going to be presenting um, here uh, in a few minutes. As David mentioned, um, we were very interested in learning more about participation uh, in subsidy, and we were particularly interested in learning about what barriers might exist to participation in child care subsidy, um, particularly from those program administrators who had identified that they either had never been approved uh, to uh, for child care subsidy or had been approved in the past but are currently no longer approved. And so we asked a series of questions specifically to those program administrators to tell us what barriers existed to them never having uh, sought out approval and what uh, or uh, if they were part of the other group who had been approved uh, in the past, what those barriers were for no longer um, continuing to be a part of the program. Um, so these were open-ended questions, and um, it's interesting. Um, what you'll see is that there are some similarities between the responses between these two groups. Um, however, uh, both groups, the aspect of um, those, the aspects of those responses uh, differ uh, differ uh, slightly. So this particular, this first slide focuses on um, programs who were never approved, and so we can see there were six. Um, 
six items, six themes that came uh, to the surface uh, with this uh, particular group of questions. Uh, we see providers mention that they've had past negative experiences with similar programs or agencies, which influence their decision to participate. We also see a uh, conversation around logistical challenges. Um, this included um, their perception of uh, difficulty around communication, time consuming paperwork, um, just general uncertainty about whether or not um, payments would be uh, on time. Um, there was really a focus on administrative burden um, and the complexities within the existing system. Some providers also talked about how they just didn't know um, or they didn't have information uh, about child care subsidy and that was a factor for them never being approved. Um, some administrators also responded that they just prefer to work with private paying families rather than those receiving subsidy. Um, they spoke in this particular question, they spoke specifically to the stability that comes with private pay arrangements. Um, there, were, uh, there was a lot of conversation and you'll see this throughout the, the slides about um, being concerned about their financial viability and the financial health um, of their business. Um, we also saw conversations around low payment rates um, and cumbersome reimbursement processes. That was also mentioned. Um, several administrators mentioned that they'd never applied because their programs were already filled and they expressed that they had satisfaction with their current clientele. Um, and it was because of this that they felt that they did not need to participate. And finally, administrators indicated that there was limited demand. Um, for those administrators who responded, they uh, described how they would never applied because they would never been approached by families who receive subsidy. Um, this could be a product of uh, geography or could be related to potential subsidy recipients not knowing enough about the program. Um, I I'll also uh, draw your attention to uh, on several of these slides, we have uh, quotes uh, directly that came directly from uh, the responses uh, to uh, to these questions. Um, they're included on the on the slide. So this particular quote uh, states, um, I don't want families to have to struggle from waiting on a phone call all day or continuous paperwork that adds to the stress of them just trying to keep their job. And these quotes are designed to illustrate um, and elevate some of the responses that are on the slide. This slide summarizes the um, responses from those administrators who identified themselves as being approved in the past, but are no longer uh, approved uh, and are not participating in the program currently. Um, we see, again, similar types of responses with this group. However, the perspective is different because these folks had participated in the system uh, in the past. And so the responses are framed uh, around that perspective. And so administrators uh, mentioned that they also had uh, previous negative experiences. Um, they talked about difficulty in resolving issues, feeling unsupported, um, encountering unprofessional behavior um, as they tried to access the system. Uh, providers expressed concerns uh, also about payment delays, uh, incomplete payments, discrepancies between reimbursement rates and their fees. Some also mentioned um, unpaid bills uh, from families. Um, they talked again in this section about the financial um, implications uh, of that. We also see uh, administrators talking about excessive paperwork, um, things like time consuming audits, uh, poor communication, um, and these were all reasons for uh, them to decide to discontinue participation. And they just expressed general frustration uh, that the processes were overly complex uh, and difficult to navigate. Um, we also see with this group that providers uh, had mentioned that they no longer have families who qualify for subsidy, um, that there isn't a demand for it in their area, and it was because of this lack of eligible families that they decided not to renew their approval. Um, something that was specific to this group of respondents was that there were a few providers that mentioned they had a change in business structure that complicated their relationship with the child care subsidy system, and it was uh, the result of the change in the business structure meant that this program, these programs had to restart the approval process, uh, which is something that they just didn't want to move forward with. And then finally, we also see um, a personal preference 
um, or convenience uh, being a factor for them not continuing to participate. Again, um, in this response, we see uh, providers talking about uh, hassles and collecting uh, payments from families, um, and just again, not receiving inquiries from families um, who, who needed uh, childcare assistance. So we, of course, we collected this information on barriers um, to participation from a very specific group of, of respondents. Um, and in, it was also really important for us to follow that up with everyone um, who participated and ask all of the participants what types of activities they felt would better support participation in child care subsidy. Uh, in Kansas. And so in this particular uh, set or in this particular questions, uh, respondents were given um, a series of um, options to choose from and they were asked to check all that apply. Um, the first two bullet points uh, that, you'll, that you see on the slide here were the two most frequently uh, responded to. Um, we had providers indicating that they would like to see um, that they felt like higher reimbursement rates would increase uh, participation. And that was about 74% of the folks uh, who responded. And then the second uh, most frequently responded to was payments directly to the provider at 71%. The other three um, items listed here um, were specific to things like uh, providers wanting to be recognized and, and additional support um, uh, in uh, the system, uh, and then we see things like wanting more um, professional development um, and resources. And um, we also see providers um, indicating that they also would like assistance uh, with the subsidy management system. So we were also curious about what providers would indicate to us uh, that would characterize uh, aspects of an ideal child care subsidy system. And we felt that child care administrators offered a very unique perspective uh, from this uh, because they are users of the system. And so it was really important for us to gather information from them about barriers, and then of course, what from their perspective would make the system work in a more functional and meaningful way uh, for them. And so in this question, we asked providers to dream big and tell us what an ideal Kansas child care subsidy system looked like. Um, in this question, they identified three critical factors. Um, they talked about streamlined payments uh, and communication. Um, and what we see throughout the responses is uh, just a general frustration from providers uh, with delays in payment processing. What they wanted to see was a system that was just quicker and more reliable. Um, they talked about how they felt the state system should consider higher subsidy rates and explore direct payments to providers. They felt that this would, act, this would help prevent revenue shortfalls uh, that are often caused by parents needing to remember to pay or delay payments. Um, improved communication was also discussed. Providers in general just want easier access to information and to support. They also mentioned efficiency and simplicity in administration. Here is, uh, again, we see discussion around administrative burden, making the system more accessible. Uh, that was a desired um, aspect that they talked about. Administrators wanted a simpler application process and again, quicker approval times. In their comments, they actually provided some suggestions for exploring an electronic submission system. Um, they talked about clearer guidelines and less cumbersome processes overall. And finally, they mentioned fairness and equitable access. Providers expressed a desire to support a broader range of families. Um, they recognized that the cost of childcare can be high and that for many families, including those who do not qualify for childcare subsidy, childcare can be a struggle. They wanted to see more middle-class families receive some assistance 
and wanted to see the system look at actual financial needs rather than strict income thresholds. So moving on to another section of the survey that was unique, um, because I, for this project, we were very interested uh, in also gathering information from administrators about their practices and perspectives on the types of social supports families receive and how they ensure all families feel supported. We were particularly interested in gaining a better understanding of those practices that were being implemented that promoted equity and accessibility of all families. And so in this next series of slides, you'll see responses to uh, several open-ended questions. Um, and they've been compiled and you'll see uh, themes, key themes that have been identified uh, within each. Providers were asked two questions about how they make their environments inclusive for all families and what policies exist in their program to promote equity and reduce potential biases related to families on child care assistance. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, um, I've combined those two questions uh, into this one slide because the pattern of responses were similar uh, to both questions. I think uh, what was, from my perspective in, in looking at the data, what was very clear uh, is that programs are committed to creating environments that promote inclusivity. They are committed to developing and maintaining policies that ensure confidentiality and privacy for families who receive child care assistance. Programs spoke at length about how they create spaces where all families feel welcome. They talked about creating systems that include flexible practices, such as discounts, payment plans, and helping with essential needs. Uh, in fact, in this section, there were a handful of responses that have really stuck with me personally um, and continue to be part of my thinking uh, about this and about a lot of other things that I, that I tend to be uh, involved with. These were individual providers that were describing how they use their own money to support children in their care by purchasing supplies or paying for field trip costs. And I think that the reason that this has stayed, I know that the reason that this has stayed with me um, uh, even now is because of what I know uh, about the, the workforce and how many uh, in the childcare workforce are they themselves in situations that are challenging financially and yet we have providers describing how they're using their own money to support children in their care. I think that this type of response, along with many of the other responses that we see, is just indicative of how Kansas providers care for the children and the families that they work with and that they support. And we see this throughout, uh, throughout our responses. We also felt that it was important to understand what misconceptions and stigmas may continue to exist around families who receive child care assistance. There is, um, there is current literature uh, that suggests that myths and stigmas continue to be prevalent in general, in society in general, around those individuals who receive government assistance. And so we felt it was important to know from a provider's perspective what may be circulating and how that may impact program decision making. Um, we asked providers to describe uh, common misconceptions or st stigmas associated with families on child care assistance. And then this is the important part. We also asked them to talk about how they dispel those myths or stigmas or misconceptions in their program. We see three themes emerge we see uh, a theme around socioeconomic stereotypes. We see a theme around privacy and equality, and we see a theme around behavioral and educational stigmas. Providers commented that there may be uh, folks, others, whose 
perceive that families receiving child care assistance may be seen as lazy or lacking education, um, or that they may be looking for handouts. Um, they did emphasize, however, that these are not accurate depictions, and they stressed how families on assistance are often hardworking and come from various backgrounds, and that they are actively trying to address these when they, um, when they come up uh, in conversation. Administrators uh, uh, mentioned that families on child care assistance may be judged if their financial status is revealed. Um, this is why administrators were incredibly clear that they promote privacy and not disclosing any kind of payment information to anyone. They stressed as well that the need for assistance can happen to anyone. And then finally, providers described um, some negative assumptions that may exist about the children of families who receive assistance. Uh, they spoke about how there is this misconception or uh, misperception uh, about uh, how children uh, who are uh, from families who receive subsidy will have uh, more behavioral issues, um, and which is uh, inaccurate, it's just not true. Um, but yet there is this uh, belief that that uh, exists. Um, administrators, however, challenge this by saying that behavioral uh, issues exist across socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, I think it was clear from you know, reading the responses in this section that administrators are committed to, uh, to dispelling these misconceptions and stigmas and are uh, attempting and creating programs that are inclusive um, and promoting um, things like privacy and confidentiality. We, so we collected this information on misconceptions and stigmas, and we were particularly interested in trying to understand how that might um, impact decision-making about uh, who uh, providers are enrolling um, in their program. And so we asked them um, a question around implicit bias and how they thought that might be influencing um, decision-making uh, in, their, in their program or, or in a program or in about enrollment. Um, we were particularly interested in um, trying to better understand, understand this and um, how they make those decisions. And, um, and so what we saw in this particular question is that there were three themes uh, that emerged. Um, one was centered around financial bias, another around behavioral issues and stigma, which we just talked about on the slide beforehand, and the third around administrative hassles and paperwork. And so the first bullet point that talks about financial bias uh, and program survival um, is really a um, uh, potentially a bias to enroll uh, private pay families because of this um, need to uh, be, to think about the sustainability of their program um, and uh, which may impact their decision to accept subsidy. And then we see, uh, again, perceived behavioral issues and stigma um, around, again, this, this belief that subsidy funded children have more behavioral issues, which, again, which is not, which is not true. Um, and that leads to decisions not to enroll or a bias again uh, for uh, private pay families. Um, we also see uh, administrative hassles and paperwork. So um, administrators talked about uh, how uh, families who were subsidy funded um, had higher administrative burden, um, more paperwork. And it was because of this uh, that that may lead to a bias to, um, to not enroll um, subsidy funded families because of uh, the, the administrative hassles and paperwork. We were, we were curious uh, as well uh, to find out how programs collaborated with other agencies and organizations. Um, and I think that we can all agree that it is the collective responsibility of all Kansas systems uh, to work together to support children and families. Um, many, if not most of our child care programs work with and collaborate with other state systems. And so we wanted to gather information on, on how they're doing that. 
um, and how they're collaborating with uh, these uh, agencies and organizations to ensure their programs supported um, and welcoming uh, to all families from diverse backgrounds. So what was very clear in these responses is that administrators uh, are collaborating with multiple state agencies. In fact, they mentioned um, several by name. They talked about Child Care Aware. They talked about Casito or the Kansas Child Care Training Opportunities Organization. They mentioned local schools. They mentioned local health departments. Um, they also talked about creating inclusive policies and an open door policy where their efforts to create um, uh, culturally responsive environments as well, which included uh, participating in training programs and implementing inclusive curricula uh, and lesson plans. Um, they also talked about the importance of uh, continuous learning uh, to support diverse families better. It was, it was incredibly important for us to develop a set of recommendations um, we felt a very heavy responsibility uh, to ensure that the voice of providers was integrated and elevated. And as I mentioned before, uh, the people who participated are the people who are using the system. And I think we all felt that it was our responsibility to represent them in that work. And after reflecting on the data, there were five recommendations uh, that emerged that we believe would strengthen um, the child care subsidy uh, program in Kansas. The first is an examination of the current administrative system. So uh, you heard uh, throughout the, the slides uh, thus far that um, providers are frustrated uh, with the current system. They talked about administrative burdens, challenges with enrollment, difficulty in communication. These were all points that were made frequently. And so we would recommend and thought it would be um, worthwhile to consider um, the subsidy system to examine practices through both an internal and external uh, environmental scan to determine ways to better address these challenges. Um, it will be incredibly important to gather both uh, information from internal users um, as well as external uh, users. Um, for example, uh, one uh, way to think about this would be to explore the development of a work group comprised of providers, advocacy folks, and subsidy personnel to work collaboratively, collaboratively to identify ways to update policies and improve the system. The second was exploring an alternative payment solution. Providers continue to mention that they preferred a different way that payments were distributed. Um, this process does vary from state to state. Many states have opted towards a payment process that reimburses the provider directly Research has indicated that when this type of contract payment um, is used, it can actually stabilize provider revenue, which is, I think, something that we would all uh, want to have happen. Another example would be to examine a cost estimation model that bases rates off the actual cost of providing high quality care. Um, historically, state reimbursement rates are determined using market rate, market rate surveys, um, which builds rates off previously, uh, previous rates charged. Um, several states have recently moved to a cost estimation model um, and have found that to be successful. The third is investigation of an alternate fee structure that promotes, promotes uh, accessibility. Uh, providers continue to see how they continue to say, excuse me, how they wanted to see more families uh, be supported. Um, they talked about uh, addressing the low reimbursement rates and how current rates don't sufficiently cover the costs of high quality care. Um, in fact, Schneider um, in 2017, Schneider and colleagues found that when there was a, a larger gap uh, between private pay and subsidy rates, the less likely it was for a provider to participate uh, in the subsidy system. So this would be something else to uh, examine. We felt it was important to acknowledge the critical nature of continuing to support providers through different avenues. Providers overwhelmingly indicated that they wanted to feel seen and heard. They talked about how recognition um, from state agencies would increase morale and highlight their wisdom, commit, commitment to the field and experience. They suggested that they wanted more opportunities for funding that could support their program. Um, a couple of folks uh, I remember in the responses talked about uh, opportunities for grants. Um, one avenue potentially to investigate is how to link increases in compensation uh, for those providers who opt to accept subsidies. 
A final recommendation is uh, centers around increasing awareness uh, to dispel myths about families who are subsidy funded. Uh, providers, uh, as we talked about before, ta uh, described common misconceptions around families who receive subsidy. Um, re recommendation would be to provide specific training and professional uh, development around implicit bias. Um, research has noted that when individuals are aware of implicit biases, they are more likely to make efforts in stopping behaviors that could lead to uh, exclusion. Another, another avenue to explore is alternate fee structures, like I had mentioned earlier. Increasing access uh, to subsidies by expanding the criteria for qualification leads to a more diverse representation of families who can take advantage of that support, and this has the potential to change the perception of who uses the system. That is a, an overview of the survey. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And uh, I think we're moving on to uh, reactions. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was very robust. And I think there's a lot for folks to think about. Um, and I think Jennifer really was able to capture a lot of the great responses from providers. But I think it's really also important to ground um, this in the direct provider experience. So we have both a family um, provider here today and a center-based provider just to share their experience with the system as we th can think about how we could work to work on continually improving the system, um, recognizing that a lot's been done. So I'll turn things over to uh, Desiree and then, uh, then she'll turn things over to Amy to offer uh, the provider perspective. Desiree. Thank you, David. I am Desiree Strait. I am a family child care provider here in Kansas that accepts subsidy. Um, right now, seven of the 12 children that I care for um, receive that subsidy. Um, I passionately feel it is important for um, to provide that support to families. I know from personal experience how hard they are working to try and get by. Um, I recently had a mother go through the review process and it was frustrating to say the least. Um, they requested the forms that needed to be done from her employer and that employer didn't get things turned in in a timely manner. Um, and so her benefits were suspended. She was penalized for something that was out of her hands. And in turn, I was penalized for not getting, because then I didn't get payment for the care I was providing. Um, it took six weeks for them to finalize that review, um, but not before she had to take a day off from work, drive 45 minutes to an office and sit and wait to be seen. Um, and then during that interview process or that review process, um, they quizzed her about getting child support. Um, she has no control over getting that. Um, and by the time she got done, uh, she felt very degraded and defeated. Um, and I know that without my support through that, she probably would have just given up. And because no one wants to feel guilty for asking for help. Um, this is what she dealt with. So as a provider, more, more times than not, we carry the burden of this system. Um, I have a contract that protects my business from situations like this, but knowing that things were out of her hands, I didn't want to add to that burden and penalize her losing that, that she may lose her job because she didn't have childcare. I had to make a decision on what bills that I would pay and not pay without getting that funding. Um, eventually she started to make some payments because she felt guilty, but then she had to turn around and not provide things within her own home, such as groceries. This is not only seen during the review process, but also the initial process of signing up Oftentimes, I will interview a family who says that they'll be using DCF subsidy and they would love to take that open spot I'm offering, but they have to wait to get the funding going. Oftentimes, providers don't have the ability to not fill those spots as quickly as possible because we have to keep our own income coming in 
to keep our business afloat. Um, I used to allow families to start um, while we waited for that process because oftentimes DCF will back pay. However, two years ago, I did this for a family and I never got paid. I cared for two children for a, over a month or, or for a month. Um, the mom kept running into issues over and over again. And finally, I had to stop providing care. And she was extremely frustrated with the system. She became frustrated with me. And um, to this day, uh, she did not make it right. And I was out over $1,200. That's a huge hit to your monthly income. Unfortunately, my stories are not uncommon. The DCF system is understaffed, overworked, and in need of some improvements. I hope with this study that some of the changes can be made so that childcare providers like myself will no longer have to carry the burden of this broken system. Um, I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Amy, as she shares. Thanks so much, Desiree. Um, again, I am Amy Gottschammer. I'm the director of her at Google's Learning. We're here in Lawrence. And I've been open 16 years here, and we have always accepted DCF uh, families. And um, when I came in this morning, I just checked our accounts, and we are currently waiting on uh, over $2,800 in payments from our current uh, DCF families. 22% uh, of the children in our care are on DCF. Um, however, there are more that sh that are eligible or should be eligible, um, but for different reasons um, are are not currently covered by DCF. Um, many of these have been talked about before. These stories aren't new, but um, the process takes too long in the beginning. They have those review periods. They get dropped, and then there's a gap in that in that payment. Um, but for the families, it's, you know, it's extensive. It, the documentation requirements are just very burdensome. They struggle to, to reach anyone. The lines are busy or they get that, that message that says, we already have too many calls. And then it's just an immediate disconnect. Um, they have to give up hours of just sitting on the phone themselves, um, days off work, or they have to go sit in an office somewhere. Um, and it just beats them down. I have sat in my own office with these families as they just kind of unburden themselves to me about how hard this process is, how much they want their children to stay in care with me. Um, but, you know, can I please hang on another few weeks or another whatever um, until we see this process through and they find out. We have been lucky to some extent in our community. Um, there have been some nonprofit groups that have set up gap funding for that initial uh, application process to cover their uh, their tuition until they do get approved so that at least um, even if they don't get approved uh, I can get paid by this this organization for the first month or so while they are here it covers that that um, tuition which is helpful um, but that does end sometimes and it's sometimes not available it's not sustainable it's just money that sometimes is there and sometimes isn't um, as as Desiree said sometimes we end up eating whatever is not covered. We do things um, as necessary to help support these families. I had a family that another nonprofit was providing for their diapers and wipes because he was in our in our ones room and they covered it until he was three years old. And then that was it. They it was a toddler um program and when the the funding cut off when he turned three well he was not potty trained at three uh, but she still could not afford those diapers and then pull-ups and and he's still four and couldn't pay for those so I am continuing to pay for his pull-ups and wipes because I know she can't you know so you know, we still do these things. We try to support our families. And I do the same things with the the privacy and confidentiality and 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 try to make sure that they feel that they're treated equitably and the same as everybody else. And what I really am so grateful for is the ones that are on DCF. They get the opportunity to come and and participate and their children participate in high quality care and education that they would not otherwise be able to afford. There's no way that they can come to a really high quality place without the DCF assistance or maybe anywhere for that matter. But 
this does give them the opportunity to be in, in a quality program, whether it's a center-based or family care program, um, with this DCF assistance. And that's great for them. Um, but if they can't, if they find the process burdensome or if they are declined, then I have empty slots. Um, so it's, you know, the burden is then back on me to go out and recruit and find families, put out ads, say I've got openings, whatever, to fill those spots with a family that otherwise was already interested, already here, but had to go through the review process or got declined. And then that burden is back on me. So um, it, it, I've got two short stories I was just going to, to share with you. Um, you know, the um, I have one where a woman was um, just, I found out, declined today, part of that $2,800 that I've been sitting on hoping to hear about. 1200 of it was hers just found out this morning that she was declined her application was declined she's a, a disabled a permanently disabled veteran um she is um part of a vocational rehab program um and up until july she was working 20 hours a week and um at which time um she was sexually assaulted and has now been going through mental and physical um treatments and has not been able to work and yet going through the DCF process required that she turned in turn in pay stubs and she couldn't um, meet those requirements the 20 hours a week was not something she can meet even though she under her by her understanding with the the VA disability should have qualified her regardless the vocational rehab program should have helped qualify her make her eligible but uh the apparently the 20 hours they said is what um made her ineligible. So she could not um, get qualifications. So now I'm potentially out this $1,200. She doesn't know if, if there's any way her child can stay here. She's never had a chance to speak to a human. It's the lines are always busy. This has all been online. Um, it's been a two to three month process, two and a half month process um, for her to just get this far to find out that she was declined. So, I mean, this is a disabled veteran that should have whole should have as many supports as, as possible and yet she can't get um the support for one child in in care so um that part is really disappointing and i and i don't know how to support her at this point so that's just one sad story i have another one of somebody that didn't want to go through the process because um she found it so burdensome she she brought her child to me as a private pay all she could afford was two days a week. And so that's what she's been doing. Her child loves it here. She's thriving. Um, she's so upset um, on the days of the week that she doesn't go to school because she wants to be at school full time. Um, but her mother just lost hours at work and she can now no longer afford to even bring her here two days a week. So she is disenrolling her completely. Um, and I said, are you not eligible for DCF? Is there something that that I can do to support you in that? And she said that she had looked into it, but the daughter's um father and her are separated, but co-parenting, getting along fine. He provides what he can, but they came into the um, the whole conversation about child support. And she was asked on the application to provide a detailed description of dad, physical description, hair color, eye color, all of this stuff. And she felt like in her words that he was being described as a, you know, the deadbeat dad type. And, um, and she just doesn't see him in that way. And she didn't feel that she should be put in that situation um, and was not, did not feel like she should go ahead and put that information in there. So she didn't, that's what her barrier was. That's where she felt it was crossing a line. And um, so she didn't fill, fill out the rest of the form. So she's now has disenrolled her child and um, she's in her pre-k year she should have the remainder of this year having some preschool before she goes to kindergarten but now she won't so um it's really sad that we're in these situations where they can't feel that they're getting more support i feel for dcf i know they've got to be short staffed we're all short staffed and and i get that i wish that there was the support and the finances to to pay more people to answer the phones and to be in the offices and and have that one-on-one -on -one connection to be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with my families and provide them that that interview and that that personal support that they need she did say that in the past that she had had um, interactions with dcf um, in earlier years and that the people that she spoke with were very kind and were very nice but that the the processes and the administrative parts having to do with timing and the computers and the application and the paper work was very difficult but when she could actually have conversations face to face with people she found the people to be very kind so i i thought you know we just gotta 
to tweak it, right? Just tweak the system and we can make this work out. But um, those are my stories and um, and uh, we we all hope for the best and, and uh, we'll keep supporting our families on here on our end as best we can. So thank you so much for your support and um, let me know at the end if there are any questions. Thank you, Amy. And I think Amy really hit the nail on the head with, you know, at the end of the day, the folks at DCF are working really hard to improve the system and hopefully it doesn't come off otherwise because we know some of their hands are tied by legislation but there's other budget things so i think the question is how we can work together to improve the system and address the challenges we can administratively and then work together to make sure the resources are there um we have two great important perspectives that also be shared christy smith the executive director of child care aware um, who really can help offer a statewide perspective. And then uh, Emily Barnes from Kansas Action for Children to offer the policy perspective. So I'll turn it over to Christy, who then can pass it on to Emily. And after that, we'll try to make sure we have some time for question and answer. So um, Christy. Thanks, David. I really appreciate it. Well, first of all, I just want to share that Child Care Aware of Kansas is a state network of child care resource and referral that provides statewide leadership that helps to build a high quality child care system. And we connect with everyone and anyone who has a stake in child care, whether it's families, child care providers, businesses, local state leaders, and our community members as well. We feel like we're a voice at the table to represent the needs and perspectives of the child care system. And one service in particular that we provide is helping families find child care through our referral system, our services, and the stories that you heard are not uncommon. In addition to the study, I also wanted to point out another resource that is available on our website, and that is the Kansas State Point in Time child care data. This highlights consensus data, child care facility counts, and our, for our focus today, it, it also lists the number of child care programs that are enrolled in DCF. And I think it's important to call out the difference between who is enrolled on the family child care and the child care centers enrolled in the DCF subsidy. So as of today, 68% of our child care centers are enrolled in the DCF subsidy program. Only 44% are enrolled in family child care. And many of us on this Zoom recognize the true cost of childcare isn't covered by DCF childcare subsidies. In fact, Jennifer mentioned it earlier in her briefing and we've heard these stories. But I think one thing that's important to note is when a childcare business has an open account balance, it just becomes increasingly difficult for families to pay off that debt. And childcare providers are not in the business to loan. And creating that causes a snowball effect that really at the end disrupts the child's stability and care that's there, as Amy just shared in the case of a child not being able to attend in her program. And then I think about Desiree and imagine living in a world where you've worked, yet you didn't receive your paycheck. I just can't even imagine that. And so for Desiree, who is a family child care provider, that means that she has to make family choices, such as paying for housing, transportation, or even food for her own family. So I would just say as a reminder is that this financial strain just not only impacts the whole system, it just also impacts the quality of care. It places unburdened stress on families and in general, just affecting the well-being of, of children involved. My motto is always when we know better, we do better. And my hope is that these stories and this study provides an awareness of gaps and barriers that we can all work together to achieve a common good. So Emily, I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate being a part of this conversation and having heard all of the stories today. Um, it's it's a really compelling conversation that we're here for. And Kansas Action for Children has worked for many years to help ensure that Kansas is the best place for children to grow healthy and thrive. And part of how we're able to do that is through work, policy work with um, our state house and agencies and advocates throughout the uh, state to look at the levers and buttons that we can push and pull to improve programs and policy for our kiddos and their families. Um, you know, we've heard about the improvements that DCF has made, you know, through the increased eligibility and tuition reimbursements. And we're hearing about the real life stories of the families and the providers in the system and the supports that they need. And so 
from our angle, this helps us begin to understand the conversation better and understand how we can use this information to collaborate and go forward. Um, we know that the childcare workforce has vibrant, dedicated members who have repeatedly participated in opportunities to advocate and improve the system. And we've seen that year after year. And again, you know, here's another opportunity for us to take this forward. So knowing that our child care subsidy program in Kansas is the largest and most stable source of funding for our child care system, and yet we actually only um, appropriate the state match, um, which is only a couple of million dollars. Uh, we're hearing about the burdens both on the agency and the providers and the families due to a lack of investment and the lack of support ability. So uh, Kansas can and should appropriate budgetary funds to fully invest in our system. That way we can address these barriers and remove them. Um, rather than dismantling systems, we can improve what we have and using the dedicated people from each perspective. Um, one of the beauties of our work is bringing people to the table and um, recognizing how we can go forward with that. So from a policy perspective, KAC really sees that, you know, we really would encourage budget appropriation into our child care development fund, knowing we're going to have to talk about state general fund dollars. Uh, we've got to figure out some other sources of how we can invest fully so that we can implement these measures. Um, that probably is going to mean looking at a true cost of care analysis. So we would encourage that. We would also like to encourage that we sit down and really talk about the barriers from the HOPE Act that, you know, what is the real life implication of uh, the work requirements and the child support requirements and are those actually leading to good results or are they just creating unnecessary barriers on the shoulders of the families and what can we do in our conversations to lift those barriers so that our families not only get on their feet, but they stay on their feet and they continue to thrive in the way that they need to for their family. So thank you for the ability to be here. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. And thanks for all the work that KAC does. Um, I will say there's been a lot of great comments in the chat. Um, and I love seeing all the support you all have for one another. Um, recognize we only have a few minutes left together. Um, are there any questions folks have uh, for Jennifer or any, any of the panelists? We can use the raised hand function and I can just call on folks. There was a question that was addressed in the chat about, um, you know, how child care providers that participate in the child care assistance program are paid. Um, and John provided some great context in, to that. Jennifer, I don't know if you want to speak just to any of the findings in terms of how providers are paid creates barriers or perceived barriers to their participation. Are you talking about specifically from the data from the survey? Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, the, um, well, I mean, we saw responses. I mean, I talked about some of those responses um, from, from the data. Um, providers talked specifically about the, you know, access, you know, payments being, um, you know, the, the payments not coming directly to the provider being really challenging and, and really affecting or really having them think about like their financial viability um, with, uh, with their business um, and which uh, also played into some of the things that we saw with the, um, uh, the bias towards uh, private pay families. So um, that the, uh, the implication being that uh, when um when they aren't sure about the the, the payment um, and the 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 uncertainty of that uh, being a possibility that that impacts their decision about whether or not to enroll a family that has subsidy. Thank you, Jennifer. And I do think you know as we think about policies that we could work on, given the strong interest in you know maybe exploring how providers are paid differently, uh, doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money and maybe something that there's a lot of appetite for from other policymakers. So hopefully we can have some more dialogue about that. Um, you know, I I see one and one question I think is worth if we have time to um, to to get at because I know we're at time was just why and I think we could have a whole discussion on sort of why um, just twelve percent of families are participating. I don't know if anyone wants to offer a strong piece, but we know that there's a number of issues that relate to that. 
include especially having providers that participate. Christy, if you want to jump in, but I, I think I, 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 what I would put forth, um, and I, I think David, you and I have talked about uh, CLASP, some studies out of CLASP, and that might be a good resource um, to offer is some background information, you know, state by state, and how our state is doing. Um, I, I think honestly, we've heard some uh, today. The, the discussion we've had today helps us understand part of what is going on with that 12% uh, number and looking at some of it is perceptions and it, perceptions aren't necessarily accurate. It, it doesn't mean it's reality. It, it means it's the way it's perceived. And so coming together to figure out, is this a perception of a problem of a barrier and that we have easy um, easy ways at an administrative level that we can implement changes? Um, or do we have some legislative work that we need to do to remove the barriers that we have requirements that families are not able to meet? And that is reducing down the, um, the participation. And so I, I think there's a combined effort here uh, that we, we can take some steps, but we also can address some of the reality or the perceived reality in that. Thanks, Emily. And I think you really captured a lot. I mean, I think there's an opportunity to improve the administrative challenges. Families and providers have to participate in the program. I think there's an opportunity to make sure where there's more resources so there can be more participation from both. And I think there's a role for philanthropy and other providers to help sort of build awareness of the program as well as sort of take on some of the other um, issues around perceptions of being enrolled. So, there's we've we're three minutes over. I think there's a lot more to come on this topic. So email Nancy or me or anyone else on our team with any questions or any thoughts uh, about further sharing this research. I'd like to really thank all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Francois, for the excellent research and presentation. Um, Amy and Desiree as providers sharing some really critical stories, Christy and Emily providing the statewide perspective, and then all of you for taking uh, over an hour to, to hear from, from folks on this topic. Um, and also just want to thank our team at the Health Fund for pulling this together and making sure that this was all available. Um, please send us your thoughts, questions, and we will have more conversation on this topic. And if you have other ideas for us, let us know. Um, we know everyone on this call is committed to improving access to high quality childcare. And we thank you all for your leadership on this issue. Have a great day.